Chapter One, Part One of the Lost House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn. The Lost House by Richard Harding Davis. Chapter One, Part One. It was a dull day at the Chancellery his excellency the american ambassador was absent in scotland unveiling a bust to bobby burns paid for by the numerous lovers of that poet in pittsburgh the first secretary was absent at aldershot observing a sham battle the military attache was absent at the crystal palace watching a football match the naval attache was absent at the duke of deptford's shooting pheasants and at the embassy the second secretary having lunched leisurely at the arts was now alone but prepared with his life to protect american interests accordingly on the condition that the story should not be traced back to him he had just confided a state secret to his young friend austin ford the london correspondent of the new york republic i will cable it ford reassured him as coming from a hungarian diplomat temporarily residing in bloomsbury while en route to his post in patagonia in that shape not even your astute chief will suspect its real source and further from the truth than that i refuse to go what i dropped in to ask he continued is whether the english are going to send over a polo team next summer to try to bring back the cup i've several other items of interest suggested the secretary the weekend parties to which you have been invited ford objected can wait tell me first what chance there is for an international polo match polo sententiously began the second secretary who himself was a crackerjack at the game is a proposition of ponies men can be trained for polo but polo ponies must be born without good ponies james the page who guarded the outer walls of the chancellery appeared in the doorway please sir a person he announced with a note for the ambassador he says it's important tell him to leave it said the secretary a polo ponies yes sir interrupted the page but he won't leave it not unless he keeps the half-crown for heaven's sake protested the second secretary then let him keep the half-crown when i say polo ponies i don't mean james although alarmed at his own temerity refused to accept the dismissal but please sir he begged i think the half-crown is for the ambassador the astonished diplomat gazed with open eyes you think what he exclaimed james upon the defensive explained breathlessly because sir he stammered it was inside the note when it was thrown out of the window ford had been sprawling in a soft leather chair in front of the open fire with the privilege of an old schoolfellow and college classmate he had been jabbing the soft coal with his walking stick causing it to burst into tiny flames his cigarette drooped from his lips his hat was cocked over one eye he was a picture of indifference merging upon boredom but at the words of the boy his attitude both of mind and body underwent an instant change it was as though he were an actor and the words thrown from the window were his cue it was as though he were a dozing fox-terrier and the voice of his master had whispered in his ear sick him for a moment with benign reproach 
the second secretary regarded the unhappy page and then addressed him with laborious sarcasm james he said people do not communicate with ambassadors in notes wrapped around half-crowns and hurled from windows that is the way one corresponds with an organ grinder ford sprang to his feet and meanwhile he exclaimed angrily the man will get away without seeking permission he ran past james and through the empty outer offices in two minutes he returned herding before him an individual seedy and soiled in appearance the man suggested that in life his place was to support a sandwich board ford reluctantly relinquished his hold upon a folded paper which he laid in front of the secretary this man he explained picked that out of the gutter in sowell street it's not addressed to any one so you read it i thought it was for the ambassador said the secretary the soiled person coughed deprecatingly and pointed a dirty digit at the paper on the inside he suggested the paper was wrapped around a half-crown and folded in at each end the diplomat opened it hesitatingly but having read what was written laughed there's nothing in that he exclaimed he passed the note to ford the reporter fell upon it eagerly the note was written in pencil on an unruled piece of white paper the handwriting was that of a woman what ford read was i am a prisoner in the street on which this paper is found the house faces east i think i am on the top story i was brought here three weeks ago they are trying to kill me my uncle charles rolf pearsall is doing this to get my money he is at garage's hotel in craven street strand he will tell you i am insane my name is dosia pearsall dale my home is dalesville kentucky u s a everybody knows me there and knows i am not insane if you would save a life take this at once to the american embassy or to scotland yard for god's sake help me when he had read the note ford continued to study it until he was quite sure his voice would not betray his interest he did not raise his eyes why he asked did you say that there is nothing in this because returned the diplomat conclusively we got a note like that or nearly like it a week ago and ford could not restrain a groan and you never told me there wasn't anything to tell protested the diplomat we handed it over to the police and they reported there was nothing in it they couldn't find the man at that hotel and of course they couldn't find the house with no more to go on than and so exclaimed ford rudely they decided there was no man and no house their theory continued the secretary patiently is that the girl is confined in one of the numerous private sanatoriums in sowell street that she is insane that because she's under restraint she imagines the nurses are trying to kill her and that her relatives are after her money insane people are always thinking like that it is a very common delusion ford's eyes were shining with a wicked joy so he asked indifferently you don't intend to do anything further what do you want us to do cried his friend ring every doorbell in sowell street and ask the parlour-maid if they are murdering a lady on the top story can i keep the paper demanded ford you can keep a copy of it consented the secretary but if you think you're on the track of a big newspaper sensation i can tell you now you're not that's the work of a crazy woman or it's a hoax you amateur detectives 
ford was already seated at the table scribbling a copy of the message and making marginal notes who brought the first paper he interrupted a handsome cab driver what became of him snapped the amateur detective the secretary looked inquiringly at james he drove away said james he drove away did he roared ford and that was a week ago ye gods what about dalesville kentucky did you cable any one there the dignity of the diplomat was becoming ruffled we did not he answered if it wasn't true that her uncle was at that hotel it was probably equally untrue that she had friends in america but retorted his friend you didn't forget to cable the state department that you all went in your evening clothes to bow to the new king you didn't neglect to cable that did you the state department returned the secretary with withering reproof does not expect us to crawl over the roofs of houses and spy down chimneys to see if by any chance an american citizen is being murdered well exclaimed ford leaping to his feet and placing his notes in his pocket fortunately my paper expects me to do just that and if it didn't i'd do it anyway and that is exactly what i'm going to do now don't tell the others in the embassy and for heaven's sake don't tell the police jimmy get me a taxi and you he commanded pointing at the one who had brought the note are coming with me to sowell street to show me where you picked up that paper on the way to sowell street ford stopped at a newspaper agency and paid for the insertion that afternoon of the same advertisement in three newspapers it read if handsome cab driver who last week carried note found in street to american embassy will mail his address to x x x care of globe he will be rewarded from the nearest police office he sent to his paper the following cable query our local correspondent dalesville kentucky concerning dosia purcell dale is she of sound mind is she heiress who controls her money what her business relations with her uncle charles rolf purcell what her present address if any questions say inquiries come from solicitors of englishmen who wants to marry her rush answer sowell street is a dark dirty little thoroughfare running for only one block parallel to harley street like it it is decorated with the brass plates of physicians and the red lamps of surgeons but just as the medical men in harley street in keeping with that thoroughfare are broad open and with nothing to conceal so those of sowell street like their hiding-place shrink from observation and their lives are as sombre secret and dark as the street itself within two turns of it ford dismissed the taxicab giving the soiled person a half-smoked cigarette he told him to walk through sowell street and when he reached the place where he had picked up the paper to drop the cigarette as near that spot as possible he then was to turn into weymouth street and wait until ford joined him at a distance of fifty feet ford followed the man and saw him when in the middle of the block without apparent hesitation drop the cigarette the house in front of which it fell was marked like many others by the brass plate of a doctor as ford passed it he hit the cigarette with his walking stick and drove it into an area when he overtook the man ford handed him another cigarette to make sure he said go back and drop this in the place you found the paper for a moment the man hesitated 
i might as well tell you ford continued that i knocked that last cigarette so far from where you dropped it that you won't be able to use it as a guide so if you don't really know where you found the paper you'll save my time by saying so instead of being confused by the test the man was amused by it he laughed appreciatively and admitted you've caught me out fair governor i want the half crown and i dropped the cigarette as near the place as i could but i can't do it again it was this way he explained i wasn't taking notice of the houses i was walking along looking into the gutter for stumps i see this paper wrapped about something around it's a copper i thinks jucked out of a window to an organ grinder i snatches it and runs i didn't take no time to look at the houses but it wasn't so far from where i showed you about the middle house in the street and on the left-hand side ford had never considered the man as a serious element in the problem he believed him to know as little of the matter as he professed to know but it was essential he could keep that little to himself no one will pay you for talking ford pointed out and i'll pay you to keep quiet so if you say nothing concerning that note at the end of two weeks i'll leave two pounds for you with james at the embassy the man who believed ford to be an agent of the police was only too happy to escape on such easy terms after ford had given him a pound on account they parted from wimpole street the amateur detective went to the nearest public telephone and called up garage's hotel he considered his first step should be to discover if mr purcell was at that hotel or had ever stopped there when the phone was answered he requested that a message be delivered to mr purcell please tell him he asked that the clothes he ordered are ready to try on he was informed that no one by that name was at the hotel in a voice of concern ford begged to know when mr purcell had gone away and had he left any address he was with you three weeks ago ford insisted he's an american gentleman and there was a lady with him she ordered a riding habit of us the same time he was measured for his clothes after a short delay the voice from the hotel replied that no one of the name of purcell had been at the hotel that winter in apparent great disgust ford rang off and took a taxicab to his rooms in german street there he packed a suitcase and drove to garages it was a quiet respectable old established house in craven street a thoroughfare almost entirely given over to small family hotels much frequented by americans after he had registered and had left his bag in his room ford returned to the office and in an assured manner asked that a card on which he had written henry w page dalesville kentucky should be taken to mr purcell in a tone of obvious annoyance the proprietor returned the card saying that there was no one of that name in the hotel and added that no such person had ever stopped there ford expressed the liveliest distress he told me i'd find him here he protested he and his niece with the garrulousness of the american abroad he confided his troubles to the entire staff of the hotel we are from the same town he explained that's why i must see him he's the only man in london i know and i've spent all my money he said he'd give me some he owes me as soon as i reached london if i can't get it i'll have to go home by wednesday's steamer and complained bitterly i haven't seen the tower nor westminster abbey in a moment ford's anxiety to meet mr purcell was apparently lost in the wave of self-pity in his disappointment the appealing 
pathetic figure real detectives and rival newspaper men even while they admitted ford obtained facts that were denied them claimed that they were given him from charity where they bullied browbeat and administered a third degree ford was embarrassed deprecatory an earnest ingenuous wide-eyed child what he called his working smile begged of you not to be cross with him his simplicity was apparently so hopeless his confidence in whomever he addressed so complete that often even the man he was pursuing felt for him a pitying contempt now as he stood uncertainly in the hall of the hotel his helplessness moved the proud lady clerk to shake her cylinders of false hair sympathetically the german waiters to regard his predicament with respect even the proprietor mr gerridge himself was ill at ease ford returned to his room on the second floor of the hotel and sat down on the edge of the bed in connecting pearsall with gerridge's both the police and himself had failed of this there were three possible explanations that the girl who wrote the letter was in error that the letter was a hoax that the proprietor of the hotel for some reason was protecting purcell and had deceived both ford and scotland yard on the other hand without knowing why the girl believed purcell would be found at garages it was reasonable to assume that in so thinking she had been purposely misled the question was should he or not dismiss garages as a possible clue and at once devote himself to finding the house in sowell street he decided for the moment at least to leave garages out of his calculations but as an excuse for returning there to still retain his room he at once started toward sowell street and in order to find out if any one from the hotel were following him he set forth on foot as soon as he made sure he was not spied upon he covered the remainder of the distance in a cab he was acting on the supposition that the letter was no practical joke but a genuine cry for help sowell street was a scene set for such an adventure it was narrow mean-looking the stucco house fronts suit stained cracked and uncared for the steps broken and unwashed as he entered it a cold rain was falling and a yellow fog that rolled between the houses added to its dreariness it was now late in the afternoon and so overcast the sky that in many rooms the gas was lit and the curtains drawn the girl apparently from observing the daily progress of the sun had written she was on the west side of the street and she believed in an upper story the man who picked up the note had said he had found it opposite the houses in the middle of the block accordingly ford proceeded on the supposition that the entire east side of the street the lower stories of the west side and the houses at each end were eliminated the three houses in the centre of the row were outwardly alike they were of four stories each was the residence of a physician and in each in the upper stories the blinds were drawn from the front there was nothing to be learned and in the hope that the rear might furnish some clue ford hastened to wimpole street in which the houses to the east backed upon those to the west in sowell street these houses were given over to furnished lodgings and under the pretext of renting chambers it was easy for ford to enter them and from the apartments in the rear to obtain several hasty glimpses of the backs of the three houses in sowell street but neither from this viewpoint did he gather any fact of interest in one of the three houses in sowell street iron bars were fastened across the windows of the fourth floor but in private sanatoriums this was neither unusual nor suspicious 
the bars might cover the windows of a nursery to prevent children from falling out or the room of some timid householder with a lively fear of burglars End of chapter one part one Chapter one part two of the Lost House by Richard Harding Davis This Librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Carolyn Chapter one part two in a quarter of an hour ford was again back in sowell street no wiser than when he had entered it from the outside at least the three houses under suspicion gave no sign in the problem before him there was one point that ford found difficult to explain it was the only one that caused him to question if the letter was genuine what puzzled him was this why if the girl were free to throw two notes from the window did she not throw them out by the dozen if she were able to reach a window opening on the street why did she not by hurling out every small article the room contained by screams by breaking the window panes attract a crowd and through it the police that she had not done so seemed to show that only at rare intervals she was free from restraint or at liberty to enter the front room that opened to the street would it be equally difficult ford asked himself for one in the street to communicate with her what signal could he give that would draw an answering signal from the girl standing at the corner hidden by the pillars of a portico the water dripping from his raincoat ford gazed long and anxiously at the black windows of the three houses like blind eyes staring into his they told no tales betrayed no secrets around him the commonplace life of the neighbourhood proceeded undisturbed somewhere concealed in the single row of houses a girl was imprisoned her life threatened perhaps even at that moment she was facing her death while on the other side shut from her by the thickness only of a brick wall people were talking reading making tea preparing the evening meal or in the street below hurrying by intent on trivial errands handsome cabs prowling in search of a fare passed through the street where a woman was being robbed of a fortune the drivers occupied only with thoughts of a possible shilling a housemaid with a jug in her hand and a shawl over her bare head hastened to the nearby public-house the postman made his rounds and delivered comic postal cards a policeman shedding water from his shining cape halted gazed severely at the sky and unconscious of the crime that was going forward within the sound of his own footsteps continued stolidly into wimpole street a hundred plans raced through ford's brain he would arouse the street with a false alarm of fire and lead the firemen with the tale of a smoking chimney to one of the three houses he would feign illness and taking refuge in one of them at night would explore the premises he would impersonate a detective and insist upon his right to search for stolen property as he rejected these and a dozen schemes as fantastic his brain and eyes were still alert for any chance advantage that the street might offer but the minutes passed into an hour and no one had entered any of the three houses no one had left them in the lower stories from behind the edges of the blinds lights appeared but of the life within there was no sign until he hit upon a plan of action ford felt there was no longer anything to be gained by remaining in sowell street already the answer to his cable might have arrived at his rooms at garages he might still learn something of purcell he decided to revisit both these places 
and while so engaged to send from his office one of his assistants to cover the Sowell Street houses. He cast a last, reluctant look at the closed blinds and moved away. As he did so, two itinerant musicians dragging behind them a small straight piano on wheels turned the corner, and as the rain had now ceased, one of them pulled the oilcloth covering the instrument, and seating himself on a camp-stool at the curb, opened the piano. After a discouraged glance at the darkened windows, the other, in a hoarse, strident tenor, to the accompaniment of the piano, began to sing. The voice of the man was raucous, penetrating. It would have reached the recesses of a tomb. "'She sells seashells on the seashore,' the vocalist wailed. "'The shells she sells are seashells, I'm sure.' The effect was instantaneous. A window was flung open, and an indignant householder with one hand frantically waved the musicians away, and with the other threw them a copper coin. At the same moment Ford walked quickly to the piano and laid a half-crown on top of it. "'Follow me to Harley Street,' he commanded. "'Don't hurry. Take your time. I want you to help me in a sort of practical joke. It's worth a sovereign to you.' he passed on quickly when he glanced behind him he saw the two men fearful lest the promised fortune might escape them pursuing him at a trot at harley street they halted breathless how long ford demanded of the one who played the piano will it take you to learn the accompaniment to a new song while you're whistling it answered the man eagerly. "'And I'm as quick at a tune as him,' assured the other anxiously. "'I can sing—' "'You cannot,' interrupted Ford. "'I'm going to do the singing myself. Where is the Republic House near here where we can hire a back room and rehearse?' Half an hour later, Ford and the piano player entered Sowell Street, dragging the piano behind them. The amateur detective still wore his raincoat, but his hat he had exchanged for a cap, and instead of a collar he had knotted around his bare neck a dirty kerchief. At the end of the street they halted, and in some embarrassment Ford raised his voice in the chorus of a song well known in the music halls. It was a very good voice, much too good for open-air work, as his companion had already assured him, but what was of chief importance to Ford, it carried as far as he wished it to go. Already in Wimpole Street, four coins of the realm, flung to him from the highest windows, had testified to its power. From the end of Sowell Street, Ford moved slowly from house to house, until he was directly opposite the three in one of which he believed the girl to be. "'We will try the new songs here,' he said. Night had fallen, and except for the gas-lamps the street was empty, and in such darkness that even without his disguise foot ran no risk of recognition. His plan was not new, it dated from the days of Richard the Lion-Hearted, but if the prisoner were alert and intelligent, even though she could make no answer, Ford believed through his effort she would gain courage, would grasp that from the outside a friend was working toward her. All he knew of the prisoner was that she came from Kentucky. Ford fixed his eyes on the house opposite and cleared his throat. The man struck the opening chords, and in a high baritone and in a cockney accent that made even the accompanist grin, Ford lifted his voice. "'The sun shines bright on my old Kentucky home,' he sang. "'Tis summer, and the darkies are gay.' He finished the song, but there was no sign. For all the impression he had made upon Sowell Street, he might have been singing in his chambers. "'And now the other,' commanded Ford. 
the house fronts echoed back the cheering notes of dixie again ford was silent and again the silence answered him the accompanist glared disgustedly at the darkened windows they don't know them songs he explained professionally give em molly married the marquis i'll sing the first one again said ford once more he broke into the pathetic cadences of the old kentucky home but there was no response he was beginning to feel angry absurd he believed he had wasted precious moments and even as he sang his mind was already working upon a new plan the song ceased unfinished it's no use he exclaimed remembering himself he added we'll try the next street but even as he spoke he leaped forward coming apparently from nowhere something white sank through the semi-darkness and fell at his feet it struck the pavement directly in front of the middle one of the three houses ford fell upon it and clutched it in both hands it was a woman's glove ford raced back to the piano once more he cried play dixie he shouted out the chorus exultantly triumphantly had he spoken it in words the message could not have carried more clearly ford now believed he had found the house found the woman and was eager only to get rid of his companion and in his own person return to sowell street but lest the man might suspect there was in his actions something more serious than a practical joke he forced himself to sing the new songs in three different streets then pretending to tire of his prank he paid the musician and left him he was happy exultant tingling with excitement good luck had been with him and hoping that garages might yet yield some clue to purcell he returned there calling up the london office of the republic he directed that one of his assistants an english lad named cuthbert should at once join him at that hotel cuthbert was but just out of oxford he wished to become a writer of fiction and as a means of seeing many kinds of life at first hands was in training as a pressman his admiration for ford amounted to almost hero worship and he regarded an assignment with his chief as a joy and an honour full of enthusiasm and as soon as a taxicab could bring him he arrived at garages where in a corner of the deserted coffee-room ford explained the situation until he could devise a way to enter the sowell street house cuthbert was to watch over it the number of the house is forty ford told him the name on the door-plate dr prothero find out everything you can about him without letting anyone catch you at it better begin at the nearest chemist's say you are on the verge of a nervous breakdown and ask the man to mix you a sedative and recommend a physician show him prothero's name and address on a piece of paper and say prothero has been recommended to you as a specialist on nervous troubles ask what he thinks of him get him to talk then visit the tradespeople and the public houses in the neighbourhood and say you are from some west end shop where prothero wants to open an account they may talk especially if his credit is bad and if you find out enough about him to give me a working basis i'll try to get into the house to-night meanwhile i'm going to make another quick search of this hotel for purcell i'm not satisfied he has not been here for why should miss dale with all the hotels in london to choose from have named this particular one unless she had good reason for it now go and meet me in an hour in sowell street cuthbert was at the door when he remembered he had brought with him from the office ford's mail and cablegrams among the latter was the one for which ford had asked wait he commanded this is about the girl you had better know what it says the cable read 
girl orphan dalesville named after her family for three generations mill owners father died four years ago purcell brother-in-law until she is twenty-one which will be in three months girl well known extremely popular lived dalesville until last year when went abroad with uncle since then reports of melancholia and nervous prostration before that health excellent no signs insanity none in family be careful how handle purcell was doctor gave up practice to look after estate is prominent in local business and church circles best reputation beware libel for the benefit of cuthbert ford had been reading the cable aloud the last paragraph seemed especially to interest him and he read it twice the second time slowly and emphasizing the word doctor a doctor he repeated do you see where that leads us it may explain several things the girl was in good health until went abroad with her uncle and he is a medical man the eyes of cuthbert grew wide with excitement you mean poison he whispered slow poison beware libel laughed ford nervously his own eyes lit with excitement suppose he exclaimed he has been using arsenic he would have many opportunities and it's colourless tasteless and arsenic would account for her depression to melancholia the time when he must turn over her money is very near and suppose he has spent the money speculated with it and lost it or that he still has it and wants to keep it in three months she will be of age and he must make an accounting the arsenic does not work fast enough so what does he do to save himself from exposure or to keep the money he throws her into a private sanatorium to make away with her ford had been talking in an eager whisper while he spoke his cigar had ceased to burn and to light it from a vase on the mantel he took a spill one of those spirals of paper that in english hotels where the proprietors of a frugal mind are still used to prevent extravagance in matches ford lit the spill at the coal fire and with his cigar puffed at the flame as he did so the paper unrolled to the astonishment of cuthbert ford clasped it in both hands blotted out the tiny flame and turning quickly to a table spread out the charred paper flat after one quick glance ford ran to the fireplace and seizing a handful of the spills began rapidly to unroll them then he turned to cuthbert and without speaking showed him the charred spill it was a scrap torn from the front page of a newspaper the half obliterated words at which ford pointed were dalesville Cour. his torn paper said ford the dalesville courier purcell has been in this hotel he handed another spill to cuthbert from that one said ford we get the date december third allowing three weeks for the newspaper to reach london purcell must have seen it just three weeks ago just when miss dale says he was in the hotel the landlord has lied to me ford rang for a waiter and told him to ask mr gerridge to come to the smoking-room as cuthbert was leaving it gerridge was entering it and ford was saying it seems you've been lying to the police and to me unless you desire to be an accessory to a murder you had better talk quick an hour later ford passed slowly through sowell street in a taxicab and finding cuthbert on guard signalled him to follow in wimpole street the cab drew up to the curb and cuthbert entered it i have found purcell said ford he is in number forty with prothero he then related to cuthbert what had happened gerridge had explained that when the police called his first thought was to protect the good name of his hotel 
he had denied any knowledge of pearsall only because he no longer was a guest and as he supposed pearsall had passed out of his life he saw no reason why through an arrest and a scandal his hotel should be involved believing ford to be in the secret service of the police he was now only too anxious to clear himself of suspicion by telling all he knew it was but little purcell and his niece had been at the hotel for three days during that time the niece who appeared to be an invalid remained in her room on the evening of the third day while purcell was absent a call from him had come for her by telephone on receiving which miss dale had at once left the hotel apparently in great agitation that night she did not return but in the morning purcell came to collect his and her luggage and to settle his account he explained that a woman relative living at the langham hotel had been taken suddenly ill and had sent for him and his niece her condition had been so serious that they had remained with her all night and his niece still was at her bedside the driver of a four-wheeler who for years had stood on the cab rank in front of garages had driven purcell to the langham this man was at the moment on the rank and from him ford learned what he most wished to know the cabman remembered purcell and having driven him to the langham for the reason that immediately after seeing him down there and while crawling for a fare in portland place a whistle from the langham had recalled him and the same luggage that had just been taken from the top of his cap was put back on it and he was directed by the porter of the hotel to take it to a house in sowell street there a manservant had helped him unload the trunks and had paid him his fare the cabman did not remember the number of the house but knew it was on the west side of the street and in the middle of the block having finished with gerridge and the cabman ford had at once gone to the langham hotel where as he anticipated nothing was known of purcell or his niece or of any invalid lady but the hall porter remembered the american gentleman who had driven up with many pieces of luggage and who although it was out of season and many suits in the hotel were vacant had found none to suit him he had then set forth on foot having left word that his trunks be sent after him the address he gave was a house in sowell street the porter recalled the incident because he and the cabman had grumbled over the fact that in five minutes they had twice to handle the same boxes it is pretty evident said ford what purcell had in mind but chance was against him he thought when he had unloaded his trunks at the langham and dismissed the cabman he had destroyed the link connecting him with garages he could not foresee that the same cabman would be loitering in the neighbourhood he should have known that four-wheelers are not as plentiful as they once were and should have given that particular one more time to get away his idea in walking to the sowell street house was obviously to prevent the new cabman from seeing him enter it but just where he thought he was clever was just where he tripped if he had remained with his trunks he would have seen that the cabman was the same one who had brought them and him from craven street and he would have given any other address in london than the one he did and now said ford that we have purcell where we want him tell me what you have learned about prothero cuthbert smiled importantly and produced a piece of paper scribbled over with notes prothero he said seems to be this sort of man if he made your coffee for you before you tasted it you'd like him to drink a cup of it first End of chapter 1 part 2chapter 2 part 1 of the lost house by richard harding davis this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter 2 part 1 
prothero said cuthbert is a man of mystery as soon as i began asking his neighbours questions i saw that he was of interest and that i was of interest i saw they did not believe i was an agent of a west end shop but a detective so they wouldn't talk at all or else they talked freely and from one of them a chemist named needham i got all i wanted he's had a lawsuit against prothero and hates him prothero got him to invest in a medicine to cure the cocaine habit needham found the cure was no cure but cocaine disguised he sued for his money and during the trial the police brought in prothero's record needham let me copy it and it seems to embrace every crime except treason the man is a russian jew he was arrested and prosecuted in warsaw vienna berlin belgrade all over europe until finally the police drove him to america there he was an editor of an anarchist paper a blackmailer a doctor of hypnotism a clairvoyant and a professional bigamist his game was to open rooms as a clairvoyant and advise silly women how to invest their money when he found out which of them had the most money he would marry her take over her fortune and skip in chicago he was tried for poisoning one wife and the trial brought out the fact that two others had died under suspicious circumstances and that there were three more unpoisoned but anxious to get back their money he was sentenced to ten years for bigamy but pardoned because he was supposed to be insane and dying instead of dying he opened a sanatorium in new york to cure victims of the drug habit in reality it was a sort of high-priced opium den the place was raided and he jumped his bail and came to this country now he is running his private hospital in sowell street needham says it's a secret rendezvous for dope fiends but they are very high-class dope fiends who are willing to pay for seclusion and the police can't get at him i may add that he is tall and muscular with a big black beard and hands that could strangle a bull in chicago during the poison trial the newspapers called him the modern bluebeard for a short time ford was silent but in the dark corner of the cab cuthbert could see that his cigar was burning briskly your friend seems a nice chap said ford at last calling on him will be a real pleasure i especially like what you say about his hands i have a plan began the assistant timidly a plan to get you into the house if you don't mind my making suggestions not at all exclaimed his chief heartily get me into the house by all means that's what we're here for the fact that i'm to be poisoned or strangled after i get there mustn't discourage us i thought said cuthbert i might stand guard outside while you got in as a dope fiend ford snorted indignantly do i look like a dope fiend he protested the voice of the assistant was one of discouragement you certainly do not he exclaimed regretfully but it's the only plan i could think of it seems to me said his chief testily that you are not so very healthy looking yourself what's the matter with your getting inside as a dope fiend and my standing guard but i wouldn't know what to do after i got inside complained the assistant and you would you are so clever the expression of confidence seemed to flatter ford i might do this he said i might pretend i was recovering from a heavy spree and ask to be taken care of until i am sober or i could be a very good imitation of a man on the edge of a nervous breakdown i haven't been five years in the newspaper business without knowing all there is to know about nerves that's it 
he cried. I will do that. And if Mr. Bluebeard Swengali, the strangler of Paris person, won't take me in as a patient, we'll come back with a couple of axes and break in. But we'll try the nervous breakdown first, and we'll try it now. I will be a naval officer, declared Ford. I made the round-the-world cruise with our fleet as a correspondent, and I know enough sea slang to fool a medical man. I am a naval officer whose nerves have gone wrong. I have heard of his sanatorium through— How? asked Ford sharply. Have I heard of his sanatorium? You saw his advertisement in the Daily World, prompted Cuthbert, home of convalescence, mental and nervous troubles cured. And, continued Ford, I have come to him for rest and treatment. My name is Lieutenant Henry Grant. I arrived in London two weeks ago on the Mauritania, but my name was not on the passenger list, because I did not want the Navy Department to know I was taking my leave abroad. I have been stopping at my own address in German Street, and my references are yourself, the Embassy, and my landlord. You will telephone him at once that, if anyone asks after Henry Grant, he is to say what you tell him to say. And if anyone sends for Henry Grant's clothes, he is to send my clothes." "'But you don't expect to be there as long as that?' exclaimed Cuthbert. "'I do not,' said Ford. "'But if he takes me in, I must make a bluff of sending for my things. No, either I will be turned out in five minutes, or if he accepts me as a patient, I will be there until midnight. If I cannot get the girl out of the house by midnight, it will mean that I can't get out myself, and you had better bring the police and the coroner.' "'Do you mean it?' asked Cuthbert. "'I most certainly do,' exclaimed Ford. "'Until twelve I want a chance to get this story exclusively for our paper. If she is not free by then, it means I have fallen down on it, and you and the police are to begin to batter in the doors.' The two young men left the cab, and at some distance from each other walked to Sowell Street. At the house of Dr. Prothero, Ford stopped and rang the bell. From across the street, Cuthbert saw the door open, and the figure of a man of almost gigantic stature block the doorway. For a moment, he stood there, and then Cuthbert saw him step to one side, saw Ford enter the house and the door close upon him. Cuthbert at once ran to a telephone, and having instructed Ford's landlord as to the part he was to play, returned to Sowell Street. There, in a state nearly approaching a genuine nervous breakdown, he continued his vigil. Even without his criminal record to cast a glamour over him, Ford would have found Dr. Prothero a disturbing person. His size was enormous, his eyes piercing, sinister, unblinking, and the hands that could strangle a bull, and with which as though to control himself he continually pulled at his black beard, were gigantic, of a deadly white, with fingers long and prehensile. In his manner, he had all the suave insolence of the Oriental, and the suspicious alertness of one constantly on guard, but also, as Ford at once noted, of one wholly without fear. He had not been over a moment in his presence before the reporter felt that to successfully lie to such a man might be counted as a triumph. Prothero opened the door into a little office leading off the hall and switched on the electric lights. For some short time, without any effort to conceal his suspicion, he stared at Ford in silence. Well, he said at last, his tone was a challenge. 
ford had already given his assumed name and profession and he now ran glibly into the story he had planned he opened his card-case and looked into it doubtfully i find i have no card with me he said but i am as i told you lieutenant grant of the united states navy i am all right physically except for my nerves they've played me a queer trick if the facts get out at home it might cost me my commission so i've come over here for treatment why to me asked prothero i saw by your advertisement said the reporter that you treated for nervous mental troubles mine is an illusion he went on i see things or rather always one thing a battleship coming at us head on for the last year i've been the executive officer of the kearsage and the responsibility has been too much for me you see a battleship inquired the jew a phantom battleship ford explained a sort of flying dutchman the time i saw it i was on the bridge and i yelled and telegraphed the engine room i brought the ship to a full stop and backed her but it was dirty weather and the error was passed over after that when i saw the thing coming i did nothing but each time i think it is real ford shivered slightly and glanced about him some day he added fatefully it will be real and i will not signal and the ship will sink in silence prothero observed his visitor closely the young man seemed sincere genuine his manner was direct and frank he looked the part he had assumed as one used to authority my fees are large said the russian at this point had ford regardless of terms exhibited a hopeful eagerness to at once close with him the jew would have shown him the door but ford was on guard and well aware that a lieutenant in the navy had but few guineas to throw away on medicines he made a movement as though to withdraw then i am afraid he said i must go somewhere else his reluctance apparently only partially satisfied the jew ford adopted opposite tactics he was never without ready money his paper saw to it that in its interests he was always able at any moment to pay for a special train across europe or to bribe the entire working staff of a cable office from his breast pocket he took a blue linen envelope and allowed the jew to see that it was filled with twenty pound notes i have means outside my pay said ford i would give almost any price to the man who can cure me the eyes of the russian flashed avariciously i will arrange the terms to suit you he exclaimed your case interests me do you see this mirage only at sea in any open place ford assured him in a park or public square but of course most frequently at sea the quack waved his great hands as though brushing aside a curtain i will remove the illusion he said and give you others more pretty he smiled meaningfully an evil leering smile when will you come he asked ford glanced about him nervously i shall stay now he said i confess in the straits and in my lodgings i am frightened you give me confidence i want to stay near you i feel safe with you if you will give me writing paper i will send for my things for a moment the jew hesitated and then motioned to a desk as ford wrote prothero stood near him and the reporter knew that over his shoulder the jew was rating what he wrote 
ford gave him the note unsealed and asked that it be forwarded at once to his lodgings to-morrow he said i will call up our embassy and give my address to our naval attache i will attend to that said prothero from now on you are in my hands and you can communicate with the outside only through me you are to have absolute rest no books no letters no papers and you will be fed from a spoon i will explain my treatment later you will now go to your room and you will remain there until you are a well man ford had no wish to be at once shut off from the rest of the house the odour of cooking came through the hall and seemed to offer an excuse for delay i smell food he laughed and i'm terrifically hungry can't i have a farewell dinner before you begin feeding me from a spoon the jew was about to refuse but with his guilty knowledge of what was going forward in the house he could not be too sure of those he allowed to enter it he wanted more time to spend in studying this new patient and the dinner-table seemed to offer a place where he could do so without the other suspecting he was under observation my associate and i were just about to dine he said you will wait here until i have another place laid and you can join us he departed walking heavily down the hall but almost at once ford whose ears were alert for any sound heard him returning approaching stealthily on tiptoe if by this manoeuvre the jew had hoped to discover his patient in some indiscretion he was unsuccessful for he found ford standing just where he had left him with his back turned to the door and gazing with apparent interest at a picture on the wall the significance of the incident was not lost upon the intruder it taught him he was still under surveillance and that he must bear himself warily murmuring some excuse for having returned the jew again departed and in a few minutes ford heard his voice and that of another man engaged in low tones in what was apparently an eager argument only once was the voice of the other man raised sufficiently for ford to distinguish his words he is an american protested the voice that makes it worse ford guessed that the speaker was purcell and that against his admittance to the house he was making earnest protest a door closing with a bang shut off the argument but within a few minutes it was evident the jew had carried his point for he reappeared to announce that dinner was waiting it was served in a room at the farther end of the hall and at the table which was laid for three ford found a man already seated prothero introduced him as my associate but from his presence in the house and from the fact that he was an american ford knew that he was purcell purcell was a man of fifty he was tall square with closely shaven face and grey hair worn rather long he spoke with the accent of a southerner and although to ford he was studiously polite he was obviously greatly ill at ease he had the abrupt inattentive manners the trembling fingers and quivering lips of one who had long been a slave to the drug habit and who now with difficulty was holding himself in hand throughout the dinner speaking to him as though interested only as his medical advisers the jew and occasionally the american sharply examined and cross-examined their visitor but they were unable to trip him in his story or to suggest that he was not just what he claimed to be when the dinner was finished the three men for different reasons were each more at his ease 
both purcell and prothero believed from the new patient they had nothing to fear and ford was congratulating himself that his presence at the house was firmly secure i think said purcell we should warn mr grant that there are in the house other patients who like himself are suffering from nervous disorders at times some silly neurotic woman becomes hysterical and may take an outcry or a scream he must not think that's all right ford reassured him cheerfully i expect that in a sanatorium it must be unavoidable as he spoke as though by a signal pre-arranged there came from the upper portion of the house a scream long insistent it was the voice of a woman raised in appeal in protest shaken with fear without for an instant regarding it the two men fastened their eyes upon the visitor the hand of the jew dropped quickly from his beard and slid to the inside pocket of his coat with eyes apparently unseeing ford noted the movement he carries a gun was his mental comment and he seems perfectly willing to use it aloud he said that i suppose is one of them prothero nodded gravely and turned to purcell will you attend her he asked as purcell rose and left the room prothero rose also you will come with me he directed and i will see you settle in your apartment your bag has arrived and is already there the room to which the jew led him was the front one on the second story it was in no way in keeping with a sanatorium or a rest cure the walls were hidden by dark blue hangings in which sparkled tiny mirrors the floor was covered with turkish rugs the lights concealed inside lamps of dull brass bedecked with crimson tassels in the air were the odours of stale tobacco smoke of cheap incense and the sickly sweet smell of opium to ford the place suggested a cigar divan rather than a bedroom and he guessed correctly that when prothero had played at palmistry and clairvoyance this had been the place where he received his dupes but the american expressed himself pleased with his surroundings and while prothero remained in the room busied himself with unpacking his bag on leaving him the jew halted in the door and delivered himself of a little speech his voice was stern sharp menacing until you are cured he said you will not put your foot outside this room in this house are other inmates who as you have already learned are in a highly nervous state the brains of some are unbalanced with my associate and myself they are familiar but the sight of a stranger roaming through the halls might upset them they might attack you might do you bodily injury if you wish for anything ring the electric bell beside your bed and an attendant will come but you yourself must not leave the room End of chapter two part one Chapter Two, Part Two of *The Lost House* by Richard Harding Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Two, Part Two. He closed the door, and Ford, seating himself in front of the coal fire, hastily considered his position. He could not persuade himself that, strategically, it was a satisfactory one the girl he sought was on the top or fourth floor he on the second to reach her he would have to pass through well-lighted halls 
up two flights of stairs and try to enter a door that would undoubtedly be locked on the other hand instead of wandering about in the rain outside the house he was now established on the inside as an inmate had there been time for a siege he would have been confident of success but there was no time the written call for help had been urgent also the scream he had heard while the manner of the two men had shown that to them it was a commonplace was to him a spur of instant action in haste he knew there was the risk of failure but he must take that risk he wished first to assure himself that cuthbert was within call and to that end put out the lights and drew aside the curtains that covered the window outside the fog was rolling between the house fronts both rain and snow were falling heavily and a solitary gas-lamp showed only a deserted and dripping street cautiously ford lit a match and for an instant let the flame flare he was almost at once rewarded by the sight of an answering flame that flickered from a dark doorway ford closed the window satisfied that his line of communication with the outside world was still intact the faithful cuthbert was on guard ford rapidly reviewed each possible course of action these were several but to lead any one of them to success he saw that he must possess a better acquaintance with the interior of the house especially was it important that he should obtain a line of escape other than the one down the stairs to the front door the knowledge that in the rear of the house there was a means of retreat by a servant's stairway or over the roof of an adjoining building or by a friendly fire escape would at least lend him confidence in his adventure accordingly in spite of prothero's threat he determined at once to reconnoitre in case of his being discovered outside his room he would explain his electric bell was out of order that when he rang no servant had answered and that he had sallied forth in search of one to make this plausible he unscrewed the cap of the electric button in the wall and with his knife cut off enough of the wire to prevent a proper connection he then replaced the cap and opening the door stepped into the hall the upper part of the house was sunk in silence but rising from the dining-room below through the opening made by the stairs came the voices of prothero and pearsall and mixed with their voices came also the sharp hiss of water issuing from a siphon the sound was reassuring apparently over their whisky and soda the two men were still lingering at the dinner-table for the moment then so far at least as they were concerned the coast was clear stepping cautiously and keeping close to the wall ford ran lightly up the stairs to the hall of the third floor it was lit brightly by a gas-jet but no one was inside and the three doors opening upon it were shut at the rear of the hall was a window the blind was raised and through the panes dripping in the rain ford caught a glimpse of the rigid iron rods of a fire escape his spirits leaped exultantly if necessary by means of this scaling ladder he could work entirely from the outside greatly elated he tiptoed past the closed doors and mounted to the fourth floor this also was lit by a gas-jet that showed at one end of the hall a table on which were medicine bottles and a tray covered by a napkin and at the other end piled upon each other and blocking the hall window were three steamer trunks painted on each were the initials d d ford breathed an exclamation dossier dale he muttered i have found you 
he was again confronted by three closed doors one leading to a room that faced the street another opening upon a room in the rear of the house and opposite across the hallway still another door he observed that the first two doors were each fastened from the outside by bolts and a spring lock and that the key to each lock was in place the fact moved him with indecision if he took possession of the keys he could enter the rooms at his pleasure on the other hand should their loss be discovered an alarm would be raised and he would inevitably come under suspicion the very purpose he had in view might be frustrated he decided that where they were the keys would serve him as well as in his pocket and turned his attention to the third door this was not locked and from its position ford guessed it must be an entrance to a servant's stairway confident of this he opened it and found a dark narrow landing a flight of steps mounting from the kitchen below and to his delight an iron ladder leading to a trap-door he could hardly forego a cheer if the trap-door were not locked he had found a third line of retreat a means of escape by way of the roof far superior to any he might attempt by the main staircase and the street door ford stepped into the landing closed the door behind him and though this left him in complete darkness he climbed the ladder and with eager fingers felt for the fastening of the trap he had feared to find a padlock but to his infant relief his fingers closed upon two bolts noiselessly and smoothly they drew back from their sockets under the pressure of his hand the trap-door lifted and through the opening swept a breath of chill night air ford hooked one leg over a round of the ladder and with his hands free moved the trap to one side an instant later he had scrambled to the roof and after carefully replacing the trap rose and looked about him to his satisfaction he found that the roof upon which he stood ran level with the roofs adjoining it to so far as devonshire street where they encountered the walls of an apartment house this was of seven stories on the fifth story a row of windows brilliantly lighted opened upon the roofs over which he planned to make his retreat ford chuckled with nervous excitement before long he assured himself i will be visiting the man who owns that flat he will think i am a burglar he will send for the police there is no one in the world i shall be so glad to see ford considered that running over roofs even when their pitfalls were not concealed by a yellow fog was an awkward exercise and decided that before he made his dash for freedom the part of a careful jockey would be to take a preliminary canter over the course accordingly among party walls of brick rain pipes chimney pipes and telephone wires he felt his way to the wall of the apartment house and then with a clearer idea of the obstacles to be avoided raced back to the point whence he had started next to discover the exact position of the fire escape he dropped to his knees and crawled to the rear edge of the roof the light from the back windows of the fourth floor showed him an iron ladder from the edge of the roof to the platform of the fire escape and the platform itself stretching below the windows the width of the building he gave a sigh of satisfaction but the same instant exclaimed with dismay the windows opening to the fire escape were closely barred for a moment he was unable to grasp why a fire escape should be placed where escape was impossible until he recognized that the ladder must have been erected first and the iron bars later probably only since miss dale had been made a prisoner 
but he now appreciated that in spite of the iron bars he was nearer that prisoner than he had ever been should he return to the hall below even while he could unlock the doors he was in danger of discovery by those inside the house but from the fire escape only a window-pane would separate him from the prisoner and though the bars would keep him at arm's length he might at least speak with her and assure her that her call for help had carried he grasped the sides of the ladder and dropped to the platform as he had already seen that the window farthest to the left was barricaded with trunks he disregarded it and passed quickly to the two others behind both of these linen shades were lowered but to his relief he found that in the middle window the lower sash as though for ventilation was slightly raised leaving an opening of a few inches kneeling on the gridiron platform of the fire escape and pressing his face against the bars he brought his eyes level with the opening owing to the lowered window-blind he could see nothing in the room nor could he distinguish any sound until above the drip and platter of the rain there came to him the peaceful ticking of a clock and the rattle of coal falling to the fender but of any sound that was human there was none that the room was empty and that the girl was in the front of the house was possible and the temptation to stretch his hand through the bars and lift the blind was almost compelling if he did so and the girl were inside she might make an outcry or guarding her there might be an attendant who at once would sound the alarm the risk was evident but encouraged by the silence ford determined to take a chance slipping one hand between the bars he caught the end of the blind and pulling it gently down let the spring draw it upward through an opening of six inches the room lay open before him he saw a door leading to another room at one side an iron cot and in front of the coal fire facing him a girl seated in a deep armchair a book lay on her knees she was intently reading the girl was young and her face in spite of an unnatural pallor and an expression of deep melancholy was one of extreme beauty she wore over a night-dress a long loose wrapper corded at the waist and as though in readiness for the night her black hair had been drawn back into smooth heavy braids she made so sweet and sad a picture that ford forgot his errand forgot his damp and chilled body and for a moment in sheer delight knelt with his face pressed close to the bars and gazed at her a movement on the part of the girl brought him to his senses she closed the book and leaning forward rested her chin upon the hollow of her hand and stared into the fire her look was one of complete and hopeless misery ford did not hesitate the girl was alone but that at any moment an attendant might join her was probable and the rare chance that now offered would be lost he did not dare to speak or by any sound attract her attention but from his breast pocket he took the glove thrown to him from the window and with a jerk tossed it through the narrow opening it fell directly at her feet she had not seen the glove approach but the slight sound it made falling caused her to start and turn her eyes toward it through the window breathless and with every nerve drawn taut ford watched her for a moment partly in alarm partly in bewilderment she sat motionless regarding the glove with eyes fixed and staring then she lifted them to the ceiling in quick succession to each of the closed doors 
and then to the window in his race across the roofs ford had lacked the protection of a hat and his hair was plastered across his forehead his face was streaked with soot and snow his eyes shone with excitement but at sight of this strange apparition the girl made no sign her alert mind had in an instant taken in the significance of the glove and for her what followed could have but one meaning she knew that no matter in what guise he came the man whose face was now pressed against the bars was a friend with a swift graceful movement she rose to her feet crossed quickly to the window and sank upon her knees speak in a whisper she said and speak quickly you are in great danger that her first thought was of his safety gave ford a thrill of shame and pleasure until now miss dosia dale had been only the chief feature in a newspaper story the unknown quantity in a problem she had meant no more to him than had the initials of her steamer trunk now through her beauty through the distress in her eyes through her warm and generous nature that had disclosed itself with her first words she became a living breathing lovely and lovable woman all of the young man's chivalry leaped to the call he had gone back several centuries in feeling he was a knight-errant rescuing beauty in distress from a dungeon cell to the girl he was a reckless young person with a dirty face and eyes that gave confidence but though a knight-errant ford was a modern knight-errant he wasted no time in explanations or pretty speeches in two minutes he whispered i'll unlock your door there's a ladder outside your room to the roof once we get to the roof the rest is easy should anything go wrong i'll come back by this fire escape wait at the window until you see the door open do you understand the girl answered with an eager nod the colour had flown to her cheek her eyes flashed in excitement a sudden doubt assailed ford you have no time to put on any more clothes he commanded i haven't got any said the girl the knight-errant ran up the fire escape pulled himself over the edge of the roof and crossing it dropped through the trap to the landing of the kitchen stairs here he expended the greater part of the two minutes he had allowed himself in cautiously opening the door into the hall he accomplished this without a sound and in one step crossed the hall to the door that held miss dale a prisoner slowly he drew back the bolts only the spring lock now barred him from her with thumb and forefinger he turned the key pushed the door gently open and ran into the room at the same instant from behind him within six feet of him he heard the staircase creak a bomb bursting could not have shaken him more rudely he swung on his heel and found blocking the door the giant bulk of prothero regarding him over the barrel of his pistol don't move said the jew at the sound of his voice the girl gave a cry of warning and sprang forward go back commanded prothero his voice was low and soft and apparently calm but his face showed white with rage ford had recovered from the shock of the surprise he also was in a rage a rage of mortification and bitter disappointment don't point that gun at me he blustered the sound of leaping footsteps and the voice of pearsall echoed from the floor below have you got him he called 
Prothero made no reply, nor did he lower his pistol. When Purcell was at his side, without turning his head, he asked in the same steady tone, "'What shall we do with him?' The face of Purcell was white and furious with fear. "'I told you!' he stormed. "'Never mind what you told me,' said the Jew. "'What shall we do with him? He knows.' ford's mind was working swiftly he had no real fear of personal danger for the girl or himself the jew he argued was no fool he would not risk his neck by open murder and as he saw it escape with the girl might still be possible he had only to conceal from prothero his knowledge of the line of retreat over the housetops explain his rain-soaked condition and wait a better chance. To this he proceeded to lie briskly and smoothly. "'Of course I know,' he taunted. He pointed to his dripping garments. "'Do you know where I've been? In the street, placing my men. I have this house surrounded. I am going to walk down those stairs with this young lady. If you try to stop me, I have only to blow my police whistle. And I will blow your brains out, interrupted the Jew. It was a most unsatisfactory climax. You have not been in the street, said Prothero. You are wet because you hung out of your window signalling to your friend. Do you know why he did not answer your second signal? Because he is lying in an area with a knife in him. You lie, cried Ford. You lie, retorted the Jew quietly, when you say your men surround this house. You are alone, you are not in the police service, you are a busybody meddling with men who think as little of killing you as they did of killing your friend. My servant was placed to watch your window, saw your signal, reported to me, and I found your assistant and threw him into an area with a knife in him. Ford felt the story was untrue. Prothero was trying to frighten him. Out of pure bravado, no sane man would boast of murder. But, and at the thought Ford felt a touch of real fear, was the man sane? It was a most unpleasant contingency. Between a fight with an angry man and an insane man, the difference was appreciable. From this new viewpoint, Ford regarded his adversary with increased weariness. He watched him as he would a mad dog. He regretted extremely he had not brought his revolver. With his automatic pistol still covering Ford, Prothero spoke to Purcell. "'I found him,' he recited, as though testing the story he would tell later, prowling through my house at night mistaking him for a burglar i killed him the kitchen window will be found open with the lock broken showing how he gained an entrance why not he demanded because protested purcell in terror the man outside will tell ford shouted in genuine relief exactly he cried the man outside who is not down an area with a knife in him but who at this moment is bringing the police he will tell as though he had not been interrupted prothero continued thoughtfully what they may say he expected to find here i can explain away later the point is that i found a strange man hatless dishevelled prowling in my house i called on him to halt he ran i fired and unfortunately killed him an englishman's home is his castle an english jury an english jury said ford briskly is the last thing you want to meet it isn't a chicago jury 
the jew flung back his head as though ford had struck him in the face ah he purred you know that too do you the purr increased to a snarl you know too much for purcell his tone seemed to bear an alarming meaning he sprang toward prothero and laid both hands upon his disengaged arm for god's sake he pleaded come away he can't hurt you not alive but dead he'll hang you hang us both we must go now this moment he dragged impotently at the left arm of the giant come he begged whether moved by purcell's wounds or by some thought of his own prothero nodded in assent he addressed himself to ford i don't know what to do with you he said so i will consult with my friend outside this door while we talk we will lock you in we can hear any move you make if you raise the window or call i will open the door and kill you you and that woman with a quick gesture he swung to the door and the spring lock snapped an instant later the bolts were noisily driven home when the second bolt shot into place ford turned and looked at miss dale this is a hell of a note he said End of chapter 2 part 2chapter 3 part 1 of the lost house by richard harding davis this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter 3 part 1 outside the locked door the voices of the two men rose in fierce whispers but ford regarded them not at all with the swiftness of a squirrel caught in a cage he darted on tiptoe from side to side searching the confines of his prison he halted close to miss dale and pointed at the windows have you ever tried to loosen those bars he whispered the girl nodded and in pantomime that spoke of failure shrugged her shoulders what did you see demanded ford hopefully the girl destroyed his hope with a shake of her head and a swift smile scissors she said but they found them and they took them away ford pointed at the open grate where's the poker he demanded they took that too i bent it trying to pry the bars so they knew the man gave her a quick pleased glance then turned his eyes to the door that led into the room that looked upon the street is that door locked no the girl told him but the door from it into the hall is fastened like the other with a spring lock and two bolts ford cautiously opened the door into the room adjoining it and except for a bed and a wash-stand found it empty on tiptoe he ran to the windows sowell street was deserted he returned to miss dale again closing the door between the two rooms the nurse miss dale whispered when she is on duty leaves that door open so that she can watch me when she goes downstairs she locks and bolts the door from that room to the hall it's locked now what's the nurse like the girl gave a shudder that seemed to ford sufficiently descriptive her lips tightened in a hard straight line she's not human she said i begged her to help me appealed to her in every way then i tried a dozen times to get past her to the stairs well the girl frowned and with a gesture signified her surroundings i'm still here she said she bent suddenly forward and with her hand on his shoulder 
turned the man so that he faced the cot the mattress on that bed she whispered rests on two iron cods they are loose and can be lifted i planned to smash the lock but the noise would have brought prothero but you could defend yourself with one of them ford had already run to the cot and dropped to his knees he found the mattress supported on strips of iron resting closely in sockets at the head and foot he raised the one nearer him and then after a moment of hesitation let it drop into place that's fine he whispered good as a crowbar he shook his head in sudden indecision but i just don't know how to use it his automatic could shoot six times before i could swing that thing on him once and if i have it in my hands when he opens the door he'll shoot and he may hit you but if i leave it where it is he won't know i know it's there and it may come in very handy later in complete disapproval the girl shook her head her eyes filled with concern you must not fight him she ordered i mean not for me you don't know the danger the man's not sane he won't give you a chance he's mad you have no right to risk your life for a stranger i won't permit it ford held up his hand for silence with a jerk of his head he signified the door they've stopped talking he whispered straining to hear the two leaned forward but from the hall there came no sound the girl raised her eyebrows questioningly have they gone she breathed if i knew that protested ford we wouldn't be here in answer to his doubt a smart rap as though from the butt of a revolver fell upon the door the voice of prothero spoke sharply you who call yourself grant he shouted before answering ford drew miss dale and himself away from the line of the door and so placed the girl with her back to the wall that if the door opened she would be behind it yes he answered purcell and i called prothero have decided how to dispose of you of both of you he has gone below to make preparations i am on guard if you try to break out or call for help i'll shoot you as i warned you and i warn you shouted ford if this lady and i do not instantly leave this house or if any harm comes to her you will hang for it prothero laughed jeeringly who will hang me he mocked my friends retorted ford they know i am in this house they know why i am here unless they see miss dale and myself walk out of it in safety they will never let you leave it don't be a fool prothero he shouted you know i am telling the truth you know your only chance for mercy is to open that door and let us go free for over a minute ford waited but from the hall there was no answer after another minute of silence ford turned and gazed inquiringly at miss dale prothero he called again for a full minute he waited and called again and then as there still was no reply he struck the door sharply with his knuckles on the instant the voice of the jew rang forth in an angry bellow keep away from that door he commanded ford turned to miss dale and bent his head close to hers now why the devil didn't he answer he whispered was it because he wasn't there or is he planning to steal away and wants us to think that even if he does not answer he's still outside the girl nodded eagerly this is it she whispered my uncle is a coward or rather he is very wise and has left the house and prothero means to follow but he wants us to think he is still on guard if we only knew she exclaimed 
as though in answer to her thought the voice of prothero called to them don't speak to me again he warned if you do i'll not answer or i'll shoot flattened against the wall close to the hinges of the door ford replied flippantly and defiantly that makes conversation difficult doesn't it he called there was a bursting report and a bullet splintered the panel of the door flattened itself against the fireplace and fell tinkling into the grate i hope i hit you roared the jew ford pressed his lips tightly together whatever happy retort may have risen to them was forever lost for an exchange of repartee the moment did not seem propitious perhaps now jeered prothero you'll believe i'm in earnest ford still resisted any temptation to reply he grinned apologetically at the girl and shrugged his shoulders her face was white but it was white from excitement not from fear what did i tell you she whispered he is mad quite mad ford glanced at the bullet hole in the panel of the door it was on a line with his heart he looked at miss dale her shoulder was on a level with his own and her eyes were following his in case he does that again said ford we would be more comfortable sitting down with their shoulders against the wall the two young people sank to the floor the position seemed to appeal to them as humorous and when their eyes met they smiled to a spectator whispered ford encouragingly we might appear to be getting the worst of this but as a matter of fact every minute cuthbert does not come means that the next minute may bring him you don't believe he was hurt asked the girl no said ford i believe prothero found him and i believe there may have been a fight but you heard what purcell said the man outside will tell if cuthbert is in a position to tell he is not down an area with a knife in him he was interrupted by a faint report from the lowest floor as though the door to the street had been sharply slammed miss dale showed that she also had heard it my uncle she said making his escape it may be ford answered the report did not suggest to him the slamming of a door but he saw no reason for saying so to the girl with his fingers locked across his knees ford was leaning forward his eyes frowning his lips tightly shut at his side the girl regarded him covertly his broad shoulders almost touching hers his strong jaw projecting aggressively and the alert observant eyes gave her confidence for three weeks she had been making a fight single-handed but she was now willing to cease struggling and relax quite happily she placed herself and her safety in the keeping of a stranger half to herself half to the man she murmured it is like the sieur de maletroit's door without looking at her ford shook his head and smiled no such luck he corrected grimly that young man was given a choice the moment he was willing to marry the girl he could have walked out of the room free i do not recall prothero saying i can escape death by any such charming alternative the girl interrupted quickly no she said you are not at all like that young man he stumbled in by chance you came on purpose to help me it was fine unselfish it was not returned ford my motive was absolutely selfish it was not to help you i came but to be able to tell about it later it is my business to do that and before i saw you i was all in the day's work but after i saw you it was no longer a part of the day's work it became a matter of a lifetime 
the girl at his side laughed softly and lightly a lifetime is not long she said when you are locked up in a room and a madman is shooting at you it may last only an hour whether it lasts an hour or many years said ford it can mean to me now only one thing he turned quickly and looked in her face boldly and steadily you he said the girl did not avoid his eyes but returned his glance with one as steady as his own you are an amusing person she said do you feel it is necessary to keep up my courage with pretty speeches i made no pretty speech said ford i proclaimed a fact you are the most charming person that ever came into my life and whether prothero shoots us up or whether we live to get back to god's country you will never leave it the girl pretended to consider his speech critically it would be almost a compliment she said if it were intelligent but when you know nothing of me it is merely impertinent i know this much of you returned ford calmly i know you are fine and generous for your first speech to me in spite of your own danger was for my safety i know you are brave for i see you now facing death without dismay he was again suddenly halted by two sharp reports they came from the room directly below them it was no longer possible to pretend to misinterpret their significance prothero exclaimed ford and his pistol they waited breathlessly for what might follow an outcry the sound of a body falling a third pistol shot but throughout the house there was silence if you really think we are in such danger declared miss dale we are wasting time we are not wasting time protested ford we are really gaining time for each minute cuthbert and the police are drawing nearer and to move about only invites a bullet and what is of more importance he went on quickly as though to turn her mind from the mysterious pistol shots should we get out of this alive i shall already have said what under ordinary conditions i might not have found the courage to tell you in many months he waited as though hopeful of a reply but miss dale remained silent they say continued ford when a man is drowning his whole life passes in review we are drowning and yet i find i can see into the past no further than the last half hour i find life began only then when i looked through the bars of that window and found you with the palm of her hand the girl struck the floor sharply this is neither the time she exclaimed nor the place to i did not choose the place ford pointed out it was forced upon me with a gun but the time is excellent at such a time one speaks only what is true you certainly have a strange sense of humour she said but when you are risking your life to help me how can i be angry of course you can't ford agreed heartily you could not be so conventional but i am conventional protested miss dale and i am not used to having young men tell me they have come into my life to stay certainly not young men who come into my life by way of a trap-door and without an introduction without a name without even a hat it's absurd it's not real it's a nightmare the whole situation is absurd ford declared here we are in the heart of london surrounded by telephones taxicabs police at least hope we are surrounded by police and yet we are crawling around to the floor on our hands and knees dodging bullets i wish it were a nightmare but as it's not he rose to his feet i think i'll try he was interrupted by a sharp blow upon the door and the voice of prothero you navy officer he panted come to the door 
stand close to it so that i needn't shout come quick ford made no answer motioning to miss dale to remain where she was he ran noiselessly to the bed and from beneath the mattress lifted one of the iron bars upon which it rested grasping it at one end he swung the bar swiftly as a man tests the weight of a baseball bat as a weapon it seemed to satisfy him for he smiled then once more he placed himself with his back to the wall do you hear me roared prothero i hear you returned ford if you want to talk to me open the door and come inside listen to me called prothero if i open the door you may act the fool and i will have to shoot you and i have made up my mind to let you live you will soon have this house to yourselves in a few moments i will leave it but where i'm going i'll need money and i want the bank-notes in that blue envelope ford swung the iron club in short half-circles come in and get them he called don't trifle with me roared the jew i may change my mind shove the money through the crack under the door and get shot returned ford not a bit like it if in one minute shouted prothero i don't see the money coming through that crack i'll begin shooting through this door and neither of you will live resting the bar in the crook of his elbow ford snatched the bank-notes from the envelope and sticking them into his pocket placed the empty envelope on the floor still keeping out of range and using his iron bar as a croupier uses his rake he pushed the envelope across the carpet and under the door when half of it had disappeared from the other side of the door it was snatched from view an instant later there was a scream of anger and on a line where ford would have been had he knelt to shove the envelope under the door three bullets splintered through the panel at the same moment the girl caught him by the wrist unheeding the attack upon the door her eyes were fixed upon the windows with her free hand she pointed at the one at which ford had first appeared the blind was still raised a few inches and they saw that the night was lit with a strange and brilliant radiance the storm had passed, and from all the houses that backed upon the one in which they were prisoners, lights blazed from every window, and in each were crowded many people, and upon the rooftop in silhouette from the glare of the street lamps below, and in the yards and clinging to the walls that separated them, were hundreds of other dark, shadowy groups changing and swaying and from them rose the confused inarticulate terrifying murmur of a mob it was as though they were on a race-track at night facing a great grandstead peopled with an army of ghosts with the girl at his side ford sprang to the window and threw up the blind and as they clung to the bars peering into the night the light in the room fell full upon them and in an instant from the windows opposite from the yards below and from the house-tops came a savage exultant yell of welcome a confusion of cries orders entreaties a great roar of warning at the sound ford could feel the girl at his side tremble what does it mean she cried cuthbert has raised the neighbourhood shouted ford jubilantly or else he cried in sudden enlightenment those shots we heard the girl stopped him with a low cry of fear she thrust her arms between the bars and pointed in the yard below them was the sloping roof of the kitchen it stretched from the house to the wall of the back yard above the wall from the yard beyond rose a ladder and face down upon the roof awry and sprawling were the motionless forms of two men 
their shining capes and heavy helmets proclaimed their calling the police exclaimed ford and the shots we thought were for those in the house were for them this is what has happened he whispered eagerly prothero attacked cuthbert cuthbert gets away and goes to the police he tells them you are here a prisoner that i am here probably a prisoner and of the attack upon himself the police tried to make an entrance from the street that was the first shot we heard and are driven back then they tried to creep in from the yard and those poor devils were killed as he spoke a sudden silence had fallen a silence as startling as had been the shout of warning some fresh attack upon the house which the prisoners could not see but which must be visible to those in the houses opposite was going forward perhaps they are on the roof whispered ford joyfully they'll be through the trap in a minute and you'll be free no said the girl she also spoke in a whisper as though she feared prothero might hear her and with her hand she again pointed cautiously above the top of the ladder appeared the head and shoulders of a man he wore a policeman's helmet but warned by the fate of his comrades he came armed balancing himself with his left hand on the rung of the ladder he raised the other and pointed a revolver it was apparently at the two prisoners and miss dale sprang to one side stand still commanded ford he knows who you are you heard that yell when they saw you they know you are the prisoner and they are glad you are still alive that officer is aiming at the window below us he's after the men who murdered his mates End of chapter three part one Chapter Three, Part Two of *The Lost House* by Richard Harding Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Three, Part Two. From the window directly beneath them came the crash of a rifle, and from the top of the ladder the revolver of the police officer blazed in the darkness again the rifle crashed and the man on the ladder jerked his hands above his head and pitched backwards ford looked into the face of the girl and found her eyes filled with horror where is my uncle purcell she faltered he has two rifles for shooting in scotland was that a rifle that her lips refused to finish the question it was a rifle ford stammered but probably prothero even as he spoke the voice of the jew rose in a shriek from the floor below them but not from the window below them the sound was from the front room opening on sowell street in the awed silence that had suddenly fallen his shrieks carried sharply they were more like the snarls and ravings of an animal than the outcries of a man take that he shouted with a flood of oaths and that and that each word was punctuated by the report of his automatic and to the amazement of ford was instantly answered from sowell street by a scattered volley of rifle and pistol shots this isn't a fight he cried it's a battle with miss dale at his side he ran into the front room and raising the blind appeared at the window and instantly as at the other end of the house there was at sight of the woman's figure a tumult of cries a shout of warning and a great roar of welcome from beneath them a man ran into the deserted street and in the glare of the gas lamp ford saw his white upturned face he was without a hat and his head was circled by a bandage but ford recognized cuthbert 
that's ford he cried pointing and the girls with him he turned to a group of men crouching in the doorway of the next house to the one in which ford was imprisoned the girl's alive he shouted the girl's alive the words were caught up and flung from window to window from housetop to housetop with savage jubilant cheers ford pushed miss dale forward let them see you he said and you will never see a stranger sight below them sowell street glistening with rain and snow lay empty but at either end of it held back by an army of police were black masses of men and beyond them more men packed upon the tops of taxicabs and hansoms stretching as far as the street lamps showed and on the roofs shadowy forms crept cautiously from chimney to chimney and in the windows of darkened rooms opposite from behind barricades of mattresses and upturned tables rifles appeared stealthily to be lost in a sudden flash of flame and with these flashes were others that came from windows and roofs with the report of a bursting bomb and that on the instant turned night into day and then left the darkness more dark ford gave a cry of delight they're taking flashlight photographs he cried jubilantly well done you pressmen the instinct of the reporter became compelling if they're alive to develop those photographs to-night he exclaimed eagerly cuthbert will send them by special messenger in time to catch the mauritania and the republic will have them by sunday i mayn't be alive to see them he added regretfully but what a feature for the sunday supplement as the eyes of the two prisoners became accustomed to the darkness they saw that the street was not as at first they had supposed entirely empty directly below them in the gutter where to approach it was to invite instant death from prothero's pistol lay the dead body of a policeman and at the nearer end of the street not fifty yards from them were three other prostrate forms but these forms were animate and alive to good purpose from a public-house on the corner a row of yellow lamps showed them clearly stretched on pieces of board and mats commandeered from hallways and cabs each of the three men lay at full length nursing a rifle their belted grey overcoats flat visored caps and the sets of their shoulders marked them for soldiers for the love of heaven exclaimed ford incredulously they've called out the guards as unconcernedly as though facing the butts at a rifle range the three sharp shooters were firing point-blank at the windows from which prothero and purcell were waging their way to the death upon the instruments of law and order beside them on his knees in the snow a young man with the silver hilt of an officer's sword showing through the silt in his great coat was giving commands and at the other end of the street a brother officer in evening dress was directing other sharpshooters bending over them like a coach of a tug-of-war team pointing with white-gloved fingers on the side of the street from which prothero was firing huddled in a doorway were a group of officials inspectors of police fire chiefs in brass helmets more officers of the guards in bear skins and wrapped in a fur coat the youthful home secretary ford saw him wave his arm and at his bidding the cordon of police broke and slowly forcing its way through the mass of people came a huge touring car its two blazing eyes sending before it great shafts of light the driver of the car wasted no time in taking up his position 
dashing halfway down the street he as swiftly backed the automobile over the gutter and up on the sidewalk so that the lights in front fell full on the door of number forty then covered by the fire from the roofs he sprang to the lamps and tilted them until they threw their shafts into the windows of the third story prothero's hiding-place was now as clearly exposed as though it were held in the circle of a spotlight and at the success of the manoeuvre the great mob raised an applauding cheer but the triumph was brief in a minute the blazing lamps had been shattered by bullets and once more save for the fierce flashes from rifles and pistols sowell street lay in darkness ford drew miss dale back into the room those men below he said are mad prothero's always been mad and your purcell is mad with drugs and the sight of blood has made them maniacs they know they now have no chance to live there's no fear or hope to hold them and one life more or less means nothing if they should return here he hesitated but the girl nodded quickly i understand she said i am going to try to break down the door and get to the roof explained ford my hope is that this attack will keep them from hearing and no protested the girl they will hear you and they will kill you they may take it into their crazy heads to do that anyway protested ford so the sooner i get you away the better i've only to smash the panels close to the bolts put my arm through the hole and draw the bolts back then another blow on the spring lock when the firing is loudest and we are in the hall should anything happen to me you must know how to make your escape alone across the hall is a door leading to an iron ladder that ladder leads to a trap-door the trap-door is open when you reach the roof run westward to a lighted building i am not going without you said miss dale quietly not after what you have done for me i haven't done anything for you yet objected ford but in case i get caught i mean to make sure there will be others on hand who will he pulled his pencil and a letter from his pocket and on the back of the envelope wrote rapidly i will try to get miss dale up through the trap in the roof you can reach the roof by means of the apartment house in devonshire street send men to meet her in the groups of officials half hidden in the doorway farther down the street he could make out the bandaged head of cuthbert cuthbert he called weighting the envelope with a coin he threw it into the air it fell in the gutter under a lamp-post and in full view and at once the two midmen below splashed the street around it with bullets but indifferent to the bullets a policeman sprang from a dark area way and flung himself upon it the next moment he staggered then limping but holding himself erect he ran heavily toward the group of officials the home secretary snatched the envelope from him and held it towards the light in his desire to learn if his message had reached those on the outside ford leaned far over the sill of the window his imprudence was all but fatal from the roof opposite there came a sudden yell of warning from directly below him a flash and a bullet grazed his forehead and shattered the window-pane above him he was deluged with a shower of broken glass stunned and bleeding he sprang back with a cry of concern miss dale ran toward him it's nothing stammered ford it only means i must waste no more time he balanced his iron rod as he would a pike staff and aimed it at the upper half of the door to the hall when the next volley comes he said i'll smash the panel 
with the bar raised high his muscles on a strain he stood alert and poised waiting for a shot from the room below to call forth an answering volley from the house-tops but no sound came from below and the sharpshooters waiting for the madmen to expose themselves held their fire ford's muscles relaxed and he lowered his weapon he turned his eyes inquiringly to the girl what's this mean he demanded unconsciously his voice had again dropped to a whisper they're short of ammunition said the girl in a tone as low as his own or they are coming here with a peremptory gesture ford waved her toward the room adjoining and then ran to the window the girl was leaning forward with her face close to the door she held the finger of one hand to her lips with the other hand she beckoned ford ran to her side some one is moving in the hall she whispered perhaps they are escaping by the roof no she corrected herself they seem to be running down the stairs again now they are coming back do you hear she asked it sounds like some one running up and down the stairs what can it mean from the direction of the staircase ford heard a curious creaking sound as of many light footsteps he gave a cry of relief the police he shouted jubilantly they've entered through the roof and they're going to attack in the rear you're safe he cried he sprang away from the door and with two swinging blows smashed the broad panel and then with a cry he staggered backward full in his face through the break he had made swept a hot wave of burning cinders through the broken panel he saw the hall choked with smoke the steps of the staircase and the stair rails wrapped in flame the house is on fire he cried they've taken to the roof and set fire to the stairs behind them with the full strength of his arm and shoulders he struck and smashed the iron bar against the door but the bolts held and through each fresh opening he made in the panels the burning cinders drawn by the draught from the windows swept into the room from the street a mighty yell of consternation told them the fire had been discovered miss dale ran to the window and the yell turned to a great cry of warning the air was rent with frantic voices jump cried some go back entreated others the fire chief ran into the street directly below her and shouted at her through his hands wait for the life net he commanded wait for the ladders ladders panted ford before they can get their engines through that mob through the jagged opening in the door he thrust his arm and jerked free the upper bolt an instant later he had kicked the lower panel into splinters and withdrawn the second bolt and at last under the savage onslaught of his iron bar the spring-lock flew apart the hall lay open before him on one side of it the burning staircase was a well of flame at his feet the matting on the floor was burning fiercely he raced into the bedroom and returned instantly carrying a blanket and a towel dripping with water he pressed the towel across the girl's mouth and nostrils hold it there he commanded blinded by the bandage miss dale could see nothing but she felt herself suddenly wrapped in the blanket and then lifted high in ford's arms she gave a cry of protest but the next instant he was running with her swiftly while the flames from the stairwell scorched her hair she was suddenly tumbled to her feet the towel and blanket snatched away 
and she saw ford hanging from an iron ladder holding out his hand she clasped it and he drew her after him the flames and cinders pursuing and snatching hungrily but an instant later the cold night air smote her in the face from hundreds of hoarse throats a yell of welcome greeted her and she found herself on the roof dazed and breathless and free at the same moment the lifting fire-ladder reached the sill of the third-story window and a fireman shielding his face from the flames peered into the blazing room what he saw showed him there were no lives to rescue stretched on the floor with their clothing in cinders and the flames licking at the flesh were the bodies of the two murderers a bullet hole in the forehead of each showed that self-destruction and cremation had seemed a better choice than the gallows and a grave of quicklime on the roof above two young people stood breathing heavily and happily staring incredulously into each other's eyes running toward them across the roofs stumbling and falling were many blue-coated helmeted angels of peace and law and order how can i tell you whispered the girl quickly how can i ever thank you and i was angry she exclaimed with self-reproach i did not understand you she gave a little sigh of content now i think i do he took her hand and she did not seem to know that he held it and she cried in wonder i don't even know your name the young man seemed to have lost his confidence for a moment he was silent the name's all right he said finally his voice was still a little shaken a little tremulous i only hope you'll like it it's got to last you a long time end of chapter three part two end of the lost house by richard harding davis recorded by carolyn in july and august two thousand and twelve in hanover germany thank you for listening